Good afternoon. Welcome to the very best part of the day, the panel discussion. My name is Robin Dines. I'm a seconded member of the Pharma Council for Northern South Island. I'm also a farm system scientist, a citizen of both Australia and New Zealand. I'm the daughter of a farmer who farmed in both Southland and Mid Canterbury. And my research has spanned composting earthworms, rumen and paunch material, salinity, the grazing ruminant, water quality, and now greenhouse gases. So it's my role to chair our fabulous panel this afternoon. And our objective as the committee who put together the panel for this afternoon is to inform you, to challenge you, to leave you feeling at least at times mildly uncomfortable, to show you where the opportunities are and to answer your burning questions. So what we've done in this afternoon is, is set up a format that will give you plenty of time for questions. But before we get to the questions, I'd like to introduce our panel members. In the fabulous green jacket is Judy Lawrence, who's a senior research fellow at the New Zealand Climate Change Research Institute at Victoria University of Wellington. Judy co-chaired the New Zealand Climate Change Adaptation Technical Working Group. She co-authored MFE's Coastal Hazards and Climate Change Guidance and is coordinating the lead author for the IPCC sixth assessment for the Australasian chapter. So Judy has vast experience nationally and internationally. Her current research projects span two national science challenges. How on earth did you land there, Judy? <laughs> I've only got one and that's enough on cascading climate change impacts, adaptive decision-making tools in coastal and flooding applications, and resilience at the coast and resilience governments. Prior to her research at VUW, Judy had several senior management roles in central and local government in New Zealand and internationally with the OECD. At the far end is Anders Crowfoot, who's a former New Yorker with a background in investment funds analysis, and he farms at Castle Point a really, truly iconic New Zealand property, which is in the Waira Rapper, along with his wife, Emily. They have 3,700 hectares of sheep beef forestry, where they run 25,000 stock units, made up of about 20,000 sheep and 1,000 cattle. Castle Point won the Waira Rapper Sheep and Beef Farm Business of the Year in 2012. Anders currently chairs the Fertiliser Quality Council and is a trustee of the Ag Recovery Foundation. He's a past president of the New Zealand Grasslands Association. He was on the Federated Farmers National Board and has a role as spokesman for climate change. He participated in the Motu Low Emissions Future Dialogue and is a great friend of us researchers. So beside Anders is Peter Atema, who's worked for the Ministry for Primary Industries and its predecessors since 2005. He hails from a dairy farm in the Manawatu and has worked in the agricultural sector throughout his career, both in New Zealand and overseas. He's currently the manager for the International Environment Team within the International Policy Directorate of MPI. He's a Bachelor of Agricultural Science, Lincoln, I hope. Oh, well, we'll ignore where that one's from. And a Master's in Environmental Management. His key areas of his work include climate change resource and environmental management and extension capability across the primary sector. And finally, I welcome James Palmer, seated just to my right. He's been the Chief Executive of the Hawke's Bay Regional Council since June 2017. Prior to joining the Council, he was Deputy Secretary of Sector Strategy at the Ministry for the Environment and was responsible for the strategic direction of New Zealand's environmental management system. James has been Director Strategy at both the Ministry for Primary Industries and the Ministry for Agriculture and Forestry. He's a director of the Sustainable Seas and Deep South National Science Challenges and a member of the Forestry Ministerial Advisory Group. So we've got a great panel to answer your questions. So what we're going to do this afternoon is have about 30 minutes where each of the panel members are going to give us a very short presentation. Here come your challenges. Then we're going to have about 45 minutes for discussion now, some of you have already handed in questions. If you would like to text a question, my mobile number is 027 671 0002. So feel free to text. If you need to know what that number is, stick your hand up and Rebecca will give you her number instead. 
Okay, Rebecca? Cool. So, more than just hot air. Globally, there's a groundswell that we have to address climate change, and that's really growing. Our youth, the most impatient of our community, are demanding action. And our global discerning, conscientious, conscious consumers are demanding that we act. And New Zealand is a global player, and we're going to hear about that from Peter. We've been at the table right through from the start. At least I think from the start, thank you. We're also, putting my science hat on, a global leader in research into livestock and greenhouse gases, because we were the first, and our investment in the Global Research Alliance is delivering globally to both developed and developing countries. Our climate change response amendment bill you'll hear about. As you know, it came up in May 2019. So we know about what our future is going to look like. And I think the thing that I will leave you with before I hand over to the panel is that it's not just about farming. This is about our whole community. So our whole community has to be responsible here. This is not about landing at all on farming, but is about us understanding where our opportunities are going to sit. And with that, I would like to ask Peter to lead off. Thanks, Peter. So um, thanks, everybody, and um, uh, it's good to see everyone this afternoon. Um, just to put in an apology, the original invitation was for John Roche, who's our MPI Chief Science Advisor. Um, so unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it today. Um, to, so um, he delegated down to me, which is a real privilege for me. Um, so. Robin asked me to have a talk about um, a wicked problem, and she's characterised um, some of the issues that I face in my sort of daily job, um, and that New Zealand, as a as a part of a global citizenry, also faces. Um, and this problem here really, for me, defines um, the work that my team does within the International Policy Directorate, but also what our role is as a tr um, trader in um, high quality food. And there's a whole lot of hooks both good and bad in the statement around, we're talking about sustainable food, we're talking about competing needs, we're talking about more people, we're talking about nutrition, but we also talk about the role of agriculture, um, both how it contributes to poverty reduction and, and social development, but also some the impacts that agriculture has um, in New Zealand and, and overseas. Um, and the last sentence is probably the, the, the most interesting one, um, because we tend to talk about things in the singularity, um, where that last sentence talks about we need to be thinking all about all of those things all at the same time. Um, and no, no one of them is more important than the other. Um, and there's no, no necessary linear response um, to achieving any of those issues. Um, so, that, so that report, um, if, as we'll refer to, it's pretty chunky. Um, but even the exact, the exact summary from that report um, is uh, really well worth reading. Um, so. For me, I'm thinking about what our global um, drivers are, and I've added domestic in there as well, because even though a lot of those are global, globally driven conversations um, around the fact that we've got 10 billion people in, in the world by 2050, they very much impact on what happens domestically. Um, there's 3.8 billion people that currently suffer from malnutrition. So malnutrition has been redefined recently. Like we, we tend to think about it in terms of um, starving sub-Saharan Africans but we've also got an obesity epidemic which has been driven by carbohydrate. And so we've got a lot of people that are um, malnourished because they're under, they've got low nutrition rates. So I'm not actually eating the right stuff. Some of that's done by choice, some of that's done by, by poverty. Um, so malnutrition is, is a whole range of different things. It's not just um, pure starvation. Um, it's also a lack of the right nutrition. Um, and I want, to, I want you to think, just remember the word nutrition while I'm talking because for me, nutrition is, is where New Zealand is going to be leading the world, and it's what we can what we can use to hang ourselves in terms of our global role um, in, the, in the food trade world. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, so New Zealand signed up to these in um, 2015. Um, they are driving, um, along with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, driving global awareness policies and what, and what measures of success of sustainability actually are. Um, traditionally, we've thought about them in terms of um, water and climate and carbon emissions, but increasingly the, the ideas of, of sustainability are going to things like soil health and human health, um, biodiversity, um, a whole range of different things which are much, much harder to measure 
um, but people are looking at those about how they how they um, understand sustainability and, and how that influences their purchasing decisions. There's a whole lot of new ideas in New Zealand um, and globally around what sustainable consumption and production actually is. Um, there's a starting to be an increasing focus on the food system and the role of food in that conversation. Um, You'd be all very well aware of the impact of social media on those on those conversations, driving a whole lot of misinformation and information. Um, some of that is like a runaway train that it's almost impossible to stop. Um, you see the role of biotechnologies, um, either company driven or governments trying to drive um, new technologies. There's a conversation in New Zealand that, New Zealand that we have to have around the role of biotechnology. Um, but again, that's driving what people think about um, sustainability. Um, obviously, biotech is a pretty central part of um, the plant-based protein discussion, um, but that's, again, the com conversation that we as a society have to have. And then there's, then there's a, the other measures of success that I talked about, where things like biodiversity, animal health, animal welfare, human health are becoming measures of sustainability. There's a whole lot of new language out there. Um, some of it just come up as just recent, um, but some of it's been around for a while, but we're just picking it up in New Zealand. Um, things like bio-based economies, circular economies, planetary boundaries, nature-based solutions. These are all conversations that are happening around the world that are driving consumer choice um, and, con and driving um, government policy around the world. Um, we've got rising protectionism, of course, um, the sort of global discontent with globalisation. Um, I was reading something this morning, got emailed to me about the impacts of trade um, on biodiversity. Um, and people saying we should be levying trade as a way to stop biodiversity loss. <laughs> it's a little point of view. Well, that we're, the, we're part of that global conversation. We're a trading nation. Um, and then the last bit around e-commerce, data, speed of innovation. So all those things, again, are driving um, global and domestic um, policy, um, production, um, and consumer choice. <coughs> so for climate change and for agriculture, there's some real challenges for um, for New Zealand, um, as, a, as a member of and a signatory of the Paris Agreement and a global citizen, around how agriculture contributes to um, reducing the impacts of climate change. Um, at the moment, the current analysis shows that for all the contributions that the, all the world's countries have put together, won't meet even two degrees. Um, and so that's an issue. Um, agriculture is 14% um, of global emissions. If you take land use change into account, it's nearly 30% of global emissions. <laughs> so the grey line there, that's, that's baseline forecasts for agricultural emissions through to, um, through to 2100. Um, but we need to get that down um, to quite a significant amount. And New Zealand has to, have, has to play a part in that. Um, and you can see the numbers down the bottom there, there's some quite significant reductions. <laughs> so, so while we're talking about the challenges of reducing emissions, people still need to eat. So the question then becomes, how do we produce more nutritious food more efficiently? Um, and this graph um, was produced um, in, at an FAO, and all the dots represent different countries. And so what we're looking to do is trying to get, and um, Robin mentioned it with the Global Research Alliance particularly, but working with developing countries to try to move them down that curve. So you're looking to, I'm oh, sorry, not better, oh, it's not going to work. Move them down the curve so they're moving from low productivity um, down into the high productivity. And we've shown in New Zealand that you can have high product, you can have good productivity while you're reducing your emissions. <laughs> so we tend to be working a lot with developing countries about moving them down that curve. Um, but it doesn't mean again that New Zealand shouldn't be continuing to improve um, its productive performance on farms. <laughs> so what does all this mean for New Zealand? <laughs> well. There's no escaping climate change. Um, I know there's concerns around what the zero carbon bill's got on it and the numbers in there and things, um, but we're, we're part of the global citizenry. We have a role to play within uh, meeting the outcomes of Paris, um, so helping the young kids, as, as Robin talked about, meeting their aspirations. Um, how that's done equitably, that's a whole separate question. <laughs> okay? But the, um, we have a role to act and we have a role to lead. Um, and part of my job and my team's job and work we do through the Global Research Alliance and others is to go out to the world and talk about New Zealand's production systems and talk about the work that you guys do and show that as an exemplar about how you can have um, highly productive, highly innovative farmers that have got low emissions. Okay? But that doesn't mean that we can't do nothing. 
And then from a policy context, there's a whole range of balances that we need to be thinking about. Um, so you might have all heard of the wellbeing framework or the wellbeing budget from the other from um, the government a couple of weeks ago. So there's all these balances around um, economic, social, environmental, and cultural outcomes that the government's all trying to work on together. Um, and again, the agricultural sector has a massive has a massive role in that, um, given that um, 42 billion dollars of our economic earnings come from the ag sector. New Zealand key part of that global food trade. <coughs> Um, but as someone mentioned in the previous um, before afternoon teas, but there's things about re reputation. Reputation is critical, and it's easily lost. Um, Twenty years ago, we could have easily rested on our laurels about being the most efficient producers in the world. We can't do that anymore. Some would say that we're not the most efficient producers in, in, anymore. Um, and again, going back to that first slide, what people understand about sustainability has changed. Is changing. Okay, so we need to look at how. We articulate our, reputa our reputation in a different way. The government ministers, particularly Minister Shaw, Parker, O'Connor and the likes, have talked about that we can be global leaders, but that has to be mandated by domestic action. So we have to be doing stuff in New Zealand that then we can go out and talk about with the rest of the world. If we're not doing that at home, then it's much harder to have a mandate to do that internationally. <laughs> Again, that's not, my, just that not, that's not just my role, that's also your role. Um, to be part of that um, international conversation. Um, we need to be able to continually reiterate and reinforce New Zealand's reputation um, and come back in, in that last two words about nutritious food. Like the one thing that New Zealand does really well is we produce high quality livestock protein and that's what the world's demanding. But we need to keep telling the world that's what it needs and that's what we can provide, even though we can only provide it to 40 million people. That's, a, that's, that's still what we, that's what we do, and that's what we do well. But again, it's, it's everybody's job to be re reiterating that and reinforcing those messages. <coughs> and there's real opportunities for innovative and efficient food producers. Um, a part of one of my roles that I have at MPI is I'm one of the judges on the Ahu Whenua Māori Farmer of the Year competition. Um, and as part of that, that judging process, I see a huge amount of innovation on farms, where farmers diversifying, doing cash crops, um, different genetics, all types of different things. And so there's huge opportunities for, for um, all farming businesses to, to be looking at um, the opportunities that exist in the global market. There's a real importance for New Zealand to continue to invest in, um, in science and R&D, um, both domestically in terms of um, providing the tools and technologies and information for you as farmers to better understand how you can manage your farm systems, but also how, for example, within the Global Research Alliance, we can develop tools and technologies that can help the global, um, the global climate outcomes. Um, an example of that is where we're New Zealand, through the um, Greenhouse Gas Research Centre in Palmerston North, um, led the world on um, mapping the gen um, genetic map of the rumen methanogens, or the bugs that produce the methane in the rumen. What they found, and they mapped the rumen bugs from all around, from different livestock and ruminants around the world, including wildlife, and we found that the genetic map is the same from all, for all animals that are for all ruminant animals. So what that means is that if we can find a vaccine or, or some or inhibitor and things, then it can be used across all ruminants. That's a massive one. That's New Zealand expertise and New Zealand money leveraging international expertise and international money to find a global solution. Um, and then the last bit is around its importance around international focus on collaboration and cooperation. So for New Zealand, we're pretty small, obviously. Um, we only have a certain ex level of expertise, but we have a lot to offer, but we also have a lot to learn. Um, and so we have, through my, the stuff that, work that my team does, um, the Global Research Alliance and the likes, we're working internationally with scientists, with farmers and farming communities to understand how we can meet some of these challenges together. So on our last note, this is um, from the FAO, again talking about food and sustainable development goals. So it's a really positive message um, because it talks about the importance of food and agriculture for humanity and, we, and what the challenges are ahead. Um, again, it's talking about nutrition, it's talking about livelihoods, um, it's talking about national growth um, for us as a, as, as a New Zealand society, but for part of our conversations in terms of helping um, international um, dealing with some of those international wicked agendas, wicked issues. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We don't need to hold any questions until we've got, gone through the panel. I did not pay Peter to say that we need more money in research. 
and, <laughs> and it didn't pay him to say what a great place Ag Research is and now we are reading world leading scientists. Peter left me with a whole lot of R's, our role, our responsibility, our reputation. We have to reiterate, we have to reinforce. Thanks, Peter. Right, I'm going to ask Judy, please, to step up and provide us with the next challenge. Kia ora tato, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Just so you know who you're listening to, I started out in Marlborough in my life. I live in the mainland, right? And I spent most of my early career as a soil conservator um, chomping around the hills in Nelson and the Waikato and worked on forestry and um, other farm plan issues. Um, then I um, went and joined the public service um, more seriously. Anyway, what I want to talk about um, fairly quickly today is that there are thunderclouds coming. And I use that as a metaphor for what will happen even if we reduce our emissions, okay? So even if we stopped our emissions today, there is enough carbon in the atmosphere to cause considerable harm to our country, our people, our economy, your sector, okay? So that's what I want to talk about. There's been a lot of talk about emissions, but you're going to have to farm your way through some fairly thundery clouds, and that's what I want to talk about. So we get this. Last year there was an intergovernmental panel on climate change report that came out which looked at the difference between achieving a two degree target and a 1.5 degree target. And the difference was substantial. And these were the um, summarised recommendations of that report that a mix of adaptation and mitigation um, is going to be required to get us to 1.5, which is where I think we would all like to be, but at the moment we're tracking over two degrees. And it may not sound much, but it is significant. To do this, we have to think about what we can do to adapt to climate change by taking um, um, proactive decisions which involve people, participatory, conversations. Now, your sector are really good at doing this, and that's the sort of thing that will have to be built upon. It needs to be integrated across all sectors, and it needs to be participatory, because we need rapid, systemic transitions, both in urban and rural areas, and neither sector can work without the other. So we're all in this together. And we have to have aligned economic and sustainable development um, in, in um, all activities, and local and regional governments and decision makers need to be supported by national governments. And we're now seeing some action at the national level to help support that process. So the report went on to say that adaptation options that also mitigate emissions can help provide synergies and cost savings. So we can do some stuff cost effectively. For example, when land management reduces emissions, the disaster risk becomes potentially a bit less. Or when low carbon buildings are designed, we can have more efficient cooling. So adaptations which have both a mitigation effect in terms of emissions and also adjust our lifestyles in the process. However, there will be trade-offs. For example, when bioenergy crops, reforestation or afforestation encroach on land, this will be needed for agriculture. So there's, a, there's going to be trade-offs between some of these things um, as we move forward. The difference between the two degrees in target can, be, uh, can significantly undermine food security, livelihoods, and ecosystem functions and services, and I think Peter, Peter just referred to that. So it's all interrelated, quite apart from our trading nation and impact from the markets. Now, in case you thought that the impacts of climate change were just a bit, few more floods and um, a, few, a little bit of a higher temperature, which might mean that you can grow certain things, you can grow grapes up the Wara Valley without, further without um, um, putting up very carbon-intensive helicopters to uh, protect the buds in winter. And, you know, that's a significant 
greenhouse gas emission, it might be regarded as an adaptation um, to enable you to grow grapes outside their range. Um, but those changes, those, those sort of practices are going to have to change because they're unsustainable. Different types of impacts. We have sea level rise and tidal effects currently in many parts of New Zealand around estuarine areas, uh, Tamaki Drive in Auckland, um, closer to home in Nelson, around the coast, um, here in Christchurch and in Dunedin and on the west coast. There are slowly emerging impacts where the sea level rise is um, attacked, where the sea is attached to the groundwater. You're going to get um, ponding and standing water as well as salinisation of land and coastal flooding. Now, some of the stuff that you've been experiencing of late around drought, for instance, is really a widening climate variability that you're seeing happen. Um, the sorts of droughts that you've seen will be moving outside the range of your experience. And so measures to deal with those droughts are going to be significantly stressed, not the least of which is MPI's adverse events policy. So how much carbon, if you don't talk about mitigation, how much carbon is taken up with taking hay across to the west coast, summer before last? If, if you multiply that 10 times, that's a lot of fuel, if it's carbon-based. If it's electric, maybe fine, okay? That's just sort of a practical example of how it could impact you. Um, extremes, large coastal storm surges from offshore, um, intense rainfall, wind and fire. And we're going to see more of those. And of course, we can't rule out accelerated sea level rise, which will have major disruptive impacts on our ports, our airports, most of which are very close to, to um, where the sea is going to be rising. And so that's about your markets. Okay? So things are interconnected. And of course, we, these won't just happen in isolation. They'll be ha some of them will be happening concurrently. So the imperative is that we need to be proactive now. We need to think long term um, for all our actions. And climate change adaptation needs to be integrated into all our decision making because this is the stuff that's going to stress your sector. And the adaptations that are taken need to be flexible so we don't lock in particular types of activities. And actually, the, the agriculture sector of all sectors is, is actually very good at adapting quickly. I mean, you think of some of the land use changes that have occurred in New Zealand over the last 20 years, from forestry to dairying, for instance, happened sort of almost overnight um, in some areas. So you can adapt, but you need to be thinking ahead further. So the climate changes are going to be ongoing and they will be quite dynamic, which has quite an impact on our ability to adapt. We have greater frequency of events, concurrent events, the time to adjust between events becomes more difficult. Now, I just want to talk very quickly about the report um, of the Climate Change Technical Working Group, which advised government last year. And we did a stock take before that, um, which was published the year before. And these are some of the um, issues that came from it. Of course, farmers have a long view, OK? But there were some who wanted to wait and see, weren't convinced, OK? They were thinking more short term, because they can farm their way out of variability. But if the range increases, and you haven't experienced that variability before, there's a potential for a much larger impact and we don't know whether you're adaptable to those. The information on climate change impacts and implication is known, um, and you've had a long experience with adjusting to some of those. And these are some of the sector um, challenges. Increased range and variability, changing baselines in both temperature and rainfall, and increased frequency of storms. And climate change um, is, is, is not really driving the resilience measures. It's other factors that are currently being um, considered for, for resilience um, framing. So this was the primary sector report card. More work was required to inform the sector about the impacts um, and how they propagate. Significant re um, work required on organising common goals and having a planned approach across the primary sector. And more work was required to anticipate and adapt um, so that 
these what we call maladaptations don't occur. Question marks over irrigation in dry areas that will become drier and stress um, the other competing users for, for irrigation. Um, increased forestry on the east coast is going to be subject not only to changes in pathogens in the forests, but also um, fire risk. And the state support will become more stressed, and so you can't rely upon um, being bailed out by the state in this matter. So my final slide is really the way forward is to um, take the best of the information you have and to develop future narratives and how you can work out your pathways through that and ask these sorts of questions. Will the options increase or decrease our exposure to changing risk? And what combination of land uses, options, um, might, you, might give you the greatest flexibility to be able to manage your way through um, very significant change? And of course, importantly, what side effects do they have? Do they increase emissions, for example? And what support might be needed? Um, and I've got no doubt that the agriculture sector is very good at harnessing um, information together, talking about it in your um, farm um, field days and um, all the other mechanisms that you're very good at doing. So um, that's basically all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. I must admit, having just been in Southland, and I'm not sure where Hamish is sitting, Southland 1.5 degrees warmer seems really attractive, Hamish. But I do accept what Judy's saying about, you know, if we see the rainfall turn into fewer but much bigger events, it would be very significant, wouldn't it? And Anders, I'm looking forward later to a conversation about how far our farmers can go with business as usual, because you farm in such a highly variable environment already. But Judy's provided us with some real challenges, and one of the things I always know about farmers is you don't always think, you don't think only about your own business, you also think about your community, perhaps more than us city folk do, and I think that's what you've spelled to us, Judy. So look forward to your questions around that. James, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, look, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the extent to which uh, the issue of climate change uh, is as much an issue for regional councils as, a, as it is for the primary sector. And, and my view is that, that both of us together are at ground zero uh, of this issue. And um, I thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about um, the journey I've gone on professionally working with the primary sector around environmental issues and particularly climate change and how I've come to understand the severity and significance of this issue for New Zealand and for farming. And it goes back to a, a, a visit I had to Antarctica, which I was very fortunate to do, to go and see some climate science down there. And while I was down there, I uh, was briefed by the, the, the scientists about how the temperature differential on an average basis between the pole and the equator when that is at its uh, greatest, so it's the coldest at the pole and warmest, warmest at the uh, equator, that holds seasonality. So if you think about a, uh, the, the planet tilting between summer and winter uh, in terms of where the sun goes, the extent to which we've got that warmth in the middle and that cold at the bottom holds the seasonality uh, in, a, in a structure, if you like. And one of the problems with climate change is that the poles are warming much faster than the equator. And so that temperature differential is changing. And that means as we go swing from summer to winter, that temperature differential, which New Zealand at the mid-latitudes is deeply influenced by, starts disrupting all of that, uh, that structure, predictability of seasonality. And it occurred to me, and I started to realise as I learnt about this, that human civilization has come about fundamentally, principally, because of climate stability. And if we look back over the life of the planet, it's been a dance over some billions of years between an evolving biosphere and an atmosphere which has been self-regulating. So the two have regulated each other in a dance or an interaction. And part of that has been the distribution of uh, the ice at the poles, uh, and that increasing coldness at the poles relative to the warmth uh, in the middle. And as that went on for millions and millions of years, the earth became more st stable seasonally. And of course, about 
7,000 years ago, that enabled the birth of agriculture and us to take advantage of seasonality to get control of biological systems to start feeding ourselves. And fundamentally, of course, that's where uh, human civilization has been built off. So actually, everything about who we are and everything about what we've built by way of our society is derived from climate stability. It's fundamental to us. So if I fast forward uh, in a time scale to uh, about 100 years ago, I want to just dwell on this joined up interest that we have as a regional council, as regional councils uh, with land use and farming. And it goes back to 1938, big storm event in my region uh, that resulted in uh, this massive uh, land landscape scale uh, erosion event, filled up the valleys, huge flooding. Uh, we had houses that had sediment right up to the roof, uh, in this case in uh, an area called Tangoyo, just north of Napier. Uh, and that resulted in the 1941 Soil Conservation and River Controls Act. And it was that piece of legislation that resulted in catchment boards, and catchment boards then became the regional councils of today. So we derive our origin as regional councils from an extreme weather event that was an interaction between weather and the large-scale land clearance that had occurred in New Zealand, which at the time was the fastest and uh, most extensive land clearance that had ever occurred in, in, in human history, in the world's world history. And so we had denuded this landscape through fire and uh, large-scale clearance and made the landscape incredibly vulnerable. Uh, and that image shows an, a, a, an intervention by uh, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council's predecessor, the Catchment Board, uh, in trying to bring some stability to that landscape uh, for soil conservation, but also to protect the communities beneath. Fast forward to 2011, uh, we had another weather bomb. This is uh, just near Lake Whakaki, near Wairoa. Uh, the whole process uh, being repeated. So after 75 years of the Soil Conservation River Controls Act, we actually hadn't made terribly much progress. And so these problems remain with us today, even though we've been in a, um, on a bit of a burning platform. And so when I fast forward to the present around water quality and water quantity and water reform, we're getting another driver coming at us which challenges a lot of what we've done historically. We have drained every wetland available in our region, about 98% of them. We've channelised our rivers to get the water off the landscape because water was a problem to be managed, a liability. It wasn't seen as an asset. Uh, wasn't seen as something that had intrinsic ecological worth that needed pr protecting. Now we're in a totally different game, where all of those engineered solutions need to be reconsidered in the context of good ecological function. So we're having to reconsider reconsider uh, flood uh, protection and drainage precisely at a time that the frequency and intensity of those heavy rainfall events are predicted to increase and increase greatly. And if that wasn't enough of a challenge to, to work with. Regional councils are responsible for civil defence and emergency management. So suddenly, when shit goes down, it's our problem uh, to protect our communities. And if that wasn't complex enough, uh, we have been transitioning from killing possums for TB to broader biodiversity uh, responsibilities. And so this all starts to come together as a bit of a perfect storm for us. It's a perfect storm for us as regional councils, but also for land managers particularly the farming community in New Zealand. Confluence of all of these issues coming at us at once. And the point I want to make is that there is a real sweet spot uh, between uh, water quality uh, and climate change. And in my region, and it's less so in this region, obviously in uh, Canterbury, nitrogen is uh, one of the big water quality issues. But in our region, sediment is number one. And in the North Island, we've got over a million hectares of highly erodible land. My region, we've got two, uh, 260,000 hectares of it. Uh, that land is losing soil at a much faster rate than it is growing it. Uh, and so you fast forward over time, and there are examples all around the planet where you can go and see where agriculture over several thousand years resulted in desertification, bedrock, and nothing left. And so if we look at those ge geological processes happening in my region, 
the ultimate conclusion is that we end up having farms that people walk off because there's only rock left. You look at climate change accelerating all of that and that starts bringing things that look a long way out much closer to us. That creates a whole bunch of risks uh, to the broader community as well. Uh, and then we've got this challenging uh, biological overlay. So what I see in that relatively challenging picture is a considerable opportunity. And that is because we can deal with a whole bunch of these issues in an integrated way on farm in a landscape by thinking about the multiple co-benefits we get from the interventions we make. And an obvious and relatively simple one is erosion control. So the spaced planting of trees with pasture uh, and grazing uh, beneath is a tried and proven way of reducing that, uh, that soil loss and sediment to water, holding soils uh, and providing uh, shade and shelter for animal welfare, providing biodiversity, pro potentially providing uh, fodder as well, particularly in times of drought. And when I fly over my region, I can still see dozens and dozens and dozens of farms that don't have a stick on them. They don't have any trees at all. So there is enormous opportunity uh, to play catch up there because we also have many properties where good soil conservation practices are undertaken. There's huge subsidies from regional councils and central government to assist with this. Uh, and then we add on to that stream bank erosion, which in our region contributes over a million tonnes of sediment every year to waterways and to our coastal environment. So good riparian management, uh, planting those up, we get shading, better water quality, better water ecology, keeping stock out of waterways. Uh, we actually reduce the stream bank erosion when the heavy rainfall comes as well because we've got good uh, stream bank protection. So I look at all of that and I think um, the opportunity does lie largely in the freshwater reform space. We see a direction of travel that's inevitable around much greater degree of farm system planning. And I know it is the position of Beef and Lamb New Zealand that uh, New Zealand should go to uh, universal farm plans. And I think it's inevitable coming out of the government's current freshwater reform package that we will have mandatory farm plans universally across New Zealand. Now that's a huge capability and capacity resource challenge, but it's also an enormous opportunity. Uh, and certainly the regional council's position that we're advocating to central government on this is that that should be industry led. So your industry good organisations such as Beef and Lamb and your rural service providers should be the ones leading the charge, working with landowners to step back from the whole farm and think about what an integrated farm planning uh, approach is that delivers multiple co-benefits, co creates much greater resilience, and we actually think about how we get more diversity into those landscapes uh, and we protect them for the changes that Judy referred to uh, as they start coming uh, at us. Uh, and I would also just make a final point around, uh, around water. So certainly in our region, um, we know that climate instability will bring a uh, shortage of precipitation, it'll bring droughts, it'll bring uh, pressure on, on us. But we also know that as a country at the bottom of the South Pacific, we will continue to get rainfall. We'll just get it uh, less predictably and we'll get it in unhelpfully large amounts. So again, that's actually a little bit of an opportunity for capturing that uh, and using it. So on farm uh, and also at, at community and larger scale, uh, there's an opportunity there. So I'm not entirely pessimistic. I think, um, I think the, the challenges are coming at us faster than anybody uh, imagined and the science every day suggests that we have underestimated the complex interaction between the biosphere and the atmosphere and how quickly this will unravel. So we actually don't have time on our side we do have some real urgency around this, but we know that we've got some existing tools in our toolkit which are tried and proven that we have not been using. And so for those of you that are thinking about um, uh, your farm system that don't currently have a plan around it, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to reach out to your regional council, uh, reach out to the farm environment planning community and think about uh, how you can start establishing a forward plan that's much much longer sighted than uh, the next season or the next few seasons and think about how you build resilience into your business. Um, there's plenty available that can be done. Uh, it's not a helpless situation, uh, but time is not on our side.
Thank you. Thanks, James. We were very clear when we asked James to set the challenge, and I must admit at one point I was seeing all the things that keep you awake at night, James. And to see the opportunities that James left us with, I'm really looking forward to the questions you're going to put back to James. But I wanted to leave you with a thought. Did anyone else have the privilege of paying a large amount of money to see Brian Cox, the world-renowned physicist, a couple of weeks ago? That's what this guy can do for his next job. I could see this guy. So Brian Cox is a physicist who talked us through the theory of relativity. He absolutely brilliantly. But what he had that we didn't give James was this massive screen behind him with incredible pixelation, wasn't it? The, the, and he showed us what how a black hole forms. When James describes seasonality, I could see him in his next role. So I'll write your reference for that, James. So thanks for setting the scene. The three of the three I think have provided us with some real challenges. There was only one of the panel that did not get a request for what they spoke about, and that was our farmer. So the floor is now yours, Anders, to speak about whatever you choose. And then please have your questions ready. Uh, as I said, if you want to text someone, wave a hand and Rebecca will pop along and get your text. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, basically, I was asked a little while ago to give a presentation um, on sort of the farmer's view of what was happening and what we were actually doing about it. Because if you read the popular media, you'd probably have the opinion that all farmers have their head in the sand and are doing absolutely nothing about it. And so, um, yeah, this, the genesis of this was probably just looking through what the challenges we're facing, um, and that includes regulation, and highlighting some of the things that we're actually doing, and then taking a look at what some things we might do in the future. So just a bit of background from me. Um, I was um, trained in the U.S., um, have a degree in computer science and psychology, um, so I'm a geek and very prone to analysis. Um, came to New Zealand in 98 when we purchased Castle Point Station um, and have always sort of been quite involved in the community. So for my sins, I spent six years on the Federated Farmers National Board. The last three of those as a spokesman on climate change, which is probably where um, I had to get upskilled in what the ETS actually means. Um, and I'd actually been studiously avoiding the zero carbon bill until I was asked to speak here. And I said, oh, now I've got to go actually get into the nitty gritty of it so I know what I'm talking about. Um, as I've chaired the Fertilizer Quality Council um, and am on the Ag Recovery um, Foundation. So Castle Point Station, um, those are a view um, up the coast towards Castle Rock and of our holiday park. We're 3750 hectares, three quarters of our income comes from sheep, which used to be split between um, meat and wool and our budget for next year, uh, we're not gonna get much income out of wool because the shearing expense is gonna eat it all up. A uh, quarter of our income from cattle. We've got 200 hectares in forestry. Probably looking to increase that in the future. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to do it, but from a long-term plan, it seems like we've got, we've got ground that's probably not that great for um, agriculture, so forestry is a, a good option. Um, very involved in tourism with a fairly large holiday park um, and motel operation. Um, structurally, the business, <laughs> It's a family-owned company. Uh, we use an advisory board, uh, five full-time staff, and lots of casuals and contractors at key times. Um, and then the holiday parks run um, with a couple and casuals there as a totally separate business. So what are farmers doing about climate change? Uh, a lot of the same things that everybody can do. Um, looking for energy efficiency, be that power usage and vehicles. Uh, looking for production efficiency, and that's actually where we've made huge gains in terms of what we're producing, you know, ki kilo of product is taking a lot less input than it used to. Um, looking at novel forages, um, we've heard some other discussions um, earlier in the other room um, about different ways of uh, working with pastures. Um, we're actually doing a fair bit of carbon sequestration. Um, if we've got forestry or um, the poplar and pole planting James was talking about on trees. And depending on your farming system, you may be sequestering um, soil uh, carbon. 
I get a bit frustrated with that, and people say, oh, you know, we ought to get that into the ETS. It's like, uh, the science in New Zealand is pretty hit and miss as to whether you're gaining or losing. Uh, if you're a hill country farmer and you're grazing your pastures well, chances are you are increasing it. The problem is next drought comes around, you'll lose a whole bunch of it. And if you have to account for it on a regular basis, if you just had a couple years of drought, do you really want to be handed a bill for the carbon you just lost? Um, increasing your soil carbon is a really good idea for all sorts of business reasons. Just leave it at that. Um, ETS participation in forestry. Uh, there's been a huge change in attitude. Um, you know, in my role with feds, when I first got in there, a lot of the discussion around climate change was actually, is it even happening? Um, by the end, it was sort of a grudging acceptance, something's probably happening, and what do we do about it? Um, now we're actually getting into some really useful conversations. So you start splitting the gases up, okay, what can we do? And I think that's where it really needs to go in the future of, you know, looking at the different gases, looking at the different effects, what can we actually do about them, how do they affect us, um, and just, yeah, considering what the options are. One of the big things that everybody's talking about now is trees on farm. Um, there are a lot of reasons to have your trees on the farm, um, and that is not necessarily planting the whole bloody farm out into one massive thing. So, as James said, um, great for erosion control, uh, shelter for stock. Um, our third reason for having trees on the farm is actually amenity value. So there are places where you just want something that looks nice. Uh, the carbon sequestration is quite useful if you're into the ETS. Um, it might provide um, income diversification. Certainly in long terms, there are a lot of families who have planted trees and it's done very well for retirement. Um, of the current generation, or splitting off a forestry block to one of the siblings, um, all sorts of things. It just gives you, it's another asset that you can actually diversify with. <coughs> and one of the other things is, um, you know, on for forestry, it's lands that's, that's not good for livestock production. Uh, my view of the ETS, it's been confusing probably had more downsides than upsides for a farm. And the way it's currently structured, if you put ag into it, it's not conducive to change behavior. If it's done, if your point of obligation is at the processor, you can be doing all sorts of things. If your neighbor down the road's doing nothing, you get no benefit. He, he doesn't, isn't doing anything. The way it's structured is actually not conducive um, to actually change, encouraging a change in behavior. Zero carbon bill. Um, I think overall it's a good approach. It's been really good to see splitting out of gases, uh, but I think there probably actually needs, needs more distinction there, um, probably splitting out gases and sectors. I think the basket approach that New Zealand's taken since Kyoto has basically just stalled all conversation, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, I think in the zero carbon bill, you sort of read through it, and there's a lot of talk about methane, but nothing about carbon dioxide. You talk to the climate scientists these, these days, and carbon dioxide is probably our problem first, second, third. Uh, methane, we need to work on it, but it shouldn't be our total focus. And I think, unfortunately, because New Zealand's emission profile has so much in um, methane, there's sort of this, everybody gets drawn to it, and they're just sort of ignoring our fossil fuel things, and our carbon dioxide emissions have grown quite dramatically. <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot being done about it. <coughs> so I think in terms of the targets, there's some targets in there. Um, my fear is that the methane one is so high on the high end that people are just going to sort of reject the whole thing out of hand. I think it, you need to have targets that are a stretch, but if you put them so, so high, people just sort of walk away from it and say, Bleh. What's the point? We can't get there. Um, I think, you know, at the, at the lower end, I think they're actually quite readily achievable um, with, the, with work. Um, will the, car the carbon bill change the status quo? Who knows? You'd hope so, but right now what we're doing, there's been absolutely no progress on fossil fuels. And in terms of being an incentive to change behavior, again, I think the things we actually need is on-farm accounting. And there are lots of good reasons why it's not done. It's really hard. Um, 
But if you aren't doing it on farm, then you're not going to be able to tell whether you're getting better or worse. And if you don't get rewarded for doing it better or punished for doing it worse, and it's just this one tax sitting here um, on your production, then you're probably not going to change a whole lot of behavior. And I think actually the PCE's report has a whole lot of useful stuff in there. One of the things he's proposed is actually using trees to offset your biological emissions which is a really interesting concept because they actually match up pretty well. The ideas of using trees to offset fossil fuel emissions is a bit problematic because fossil fuel emissions are pretty much permanent. And trees, well, if you have a fire, there they went. Future directions, um, new forages, feeds, supplements, technology, <laughs> things like um, inhibitors and be it vaccine um, or feed, some really interesting stuff going on there. Some of it's quite promising. Probably one of the critical ones is actually having stable political policy. Um, I've been involved in ETS since it started. It seems to change on a very regular basis, which really puts you off. Um, new products coming on the market that um, you might be able to diversify into. And probably one of the critical things is um, yeah, having, having better market so that if, we're, if we are trying to keep our production at a level um, at one constant level, which in terms of methane emissions, if you're doing that, then that's when you're not having, having an adverse impact. Um, but all our other costs are going up, so if we actually aren't getting more money for the product we're producing, we're going to go out the back door. So thank you for that, and happy to take questions of the panel. Thanks, Anders. Yeah, exactly what we were looking for you to do, Anders, and, and really do appreciate you bringing your perspective. I've got a couple of questions here, uh, but I'm now looking to the audience. But first I wanted, we, we tend to throw around two words, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is where we look to reduce the greenhouse gases or to increase the sink. So you talked about an inhibitor or a vaccine, they're a mitigation strategy. Adaptation is our ability to adjust. So just to clarify those two. Right, do we have any questions from the floor for our panelists? While you're raising your hands, thank you, Kerry. Um, <clears throat> the question is, if we are looking at adaptations uh, and we talk about the need for everybody in this country to have a part in the whole thing, um, how do we go about uh, getting getting those people on an individual family basis to adapt. So I'm talking about a family, perhaps in the centre of a city. How, do, how does the panel suggest that there's a role for individuals to make a change? Because we as farmers are trying to look at solutions and making a change to our business as a whole. How do you get the individuals to do, do so in their own situation? I'm going to ask Judy first, and first I'm going to confess to what I put on a whiteboard yesterday. M-A-M, which was middle-aged mother. My car is a Honda S2000, one. Um, BR, boy racer. Mitsubishi Lancer Evolve Triple S, zero, because I beat him at the traffic lights the other day. Um, and Kerry, I've got it figured out. I'm saving for a Tesla, because I'll still better beat him at the traffic lights. I just have to save a little more. Um, and in my family, we've taken a tack on, on turning our food wastage to zero. So that's what we're doing right now. But I fully take that, and I'm going to pass first to you, Judy, and then to you, James, because perhaps you might be having spent a lot of time in Wellington. So, Judy, what do we do to bring our urban dwellers along? Yeah. The, uh, the sort of things that Robin was just describing are the sorts of things that I see um, my cohort, my children's cohort, are uh, doing. And that's already happening. The other things that are happening are that we're all e eating less meat, red meat, and that is an emission reduction action. And there are also adjustments in terms of how people are, uh, the mobility of people. So movement to electric bikes, most of my friends have, and, and I don't actually have an electric bike, but I have a bike. Um, I use my muscles rather than, 
rather than um, use electricity. Um, but there's a lot of shifting of people from using cars more to public transport and using um, bike transport. Um, so there are a lot of adjustments that are very visible in urban areas. Now that's largely to do with emission reductions. In terms of adaptations to the impacts of climate change, one of the principal ones that I've observed is people working from home. And so when the storm occurs, which it does periodically, and it cuts off the road where I live in Wellington, I can continue to work. And that's quite a, a conscious choice that people are taking to, to more flexible working um, and adapting to being flexible when other you know, adverse events occur. So those are some of the, um, the things, but principally, the adaptation actions have to be taken at a community <coughs> level, and they are supported by those agencies who are responsible for working for communities, which is the sort of local government and regional government. And there's a lot happening to develop adaptation plans in the cities, either through the um, cities programs like the Rockefeller Resilience Cities, and I think Christchurch, Auckland, and Wellington, are members of that, and those adaptation plans are being actively developed currently by local government and including local communities in those conversations because they affect them. So there's a lot happening in the city. I also saw a screaming match on the side of the netball court last Saturday, and it was a 17-year-old screaming at her mother because how dare her mother buy two plastic water bottles for the two daughters. You know, she should have only bought one, for heaven's sake. I mean, imagine if she'd bought one, Kerry, what would they have screamed at then? But, you know, the youth, the youth that has this impatience for change. Yeah. James, you're thinking from the Regional Council perspective around I, these towns and cities. Yeah, look, I, I think, look, clearly youth are leading the way. And um, it, to many, in many respects, we're, the, the political process, both at local level and at central government level, is actually being overwhelmed by the the societal shift and change there. And, and, and look, social media and communication's probably got something to do with that. And, but, you know, youth have ever been, uh, you know, challenging the status quo and, and, and thinking progressively. And the existential uh, risks, if you like, for climate change, I think, um, you know, feel, you know, uh, very real for people that still have a lot of life yet to live and have aspirations. So, so youth are driving that. And I think, you know, there's a lot of behavioural change happening in our urban communities the sorts of things uh, that, that Judy referred to. Um, and, you know, we know that, that transport's a, a big Achilles heel for New Zealand. We've already got huge amount of renewables in our, ele in our electricity network. Uh, and so it is in, in, in that space in terms of mitigation that uh, New Zealand's got a lot of, lot of work to do. Um, but I think actually on this, this, this question of adaptation, there are some, there are some things that, that people can do to make themselves more resilient. Uh, one of the things that we promote is uh, is for urban households to have some form of water storage. So an outdoor water tank connected to the roof. I mean, we've got we've got millions of squ square metres of roof, roofs in New Zealand with water actually going into our um, wastewater unhelpfully and stormwater networks putting a whole bunch of pressure uh, on our infrastructure, etc. And we're not collecting that water. So uh, particularly in the areas like the east coast of New Zealand, Canterbury being an example, where... Uh, we can expect to get you know, really dry uh, summer events. Having households, uh, having water available during times of restriction, uh, etc., is a pretty simple and basic opportunity just uh, sitting uh, right, right in front of us. But the big adapt adaptation challenge goes to this question of uh, sea level rise and increased uh, intensity of flooding events, which means that we've got uh, we've got tens of thousands of stranded. <coughs> homes in New Zealand that are either uh, by the coast, very low lying. Judy referred to the ports and airports. That's the that's the kind of the really big issue that we haven't got our heads around. How do you help somebody who's mortgaged to the hilt or paid off their home and it's their only asset to retreat from from this environment and potentially do it at speed? What is the public contribution to that? What is the private responsibility? That is kind of the, the, the one of the bigger. Uh, and more complex societal questions that we've got no clear answers for at the moment. Uh, we've done some work in our region around our coastal communities on creating pathways for uh, coastal defence and coastal retreat, and there's a game plan around that for the next 100 years, but we haven't figured out who's going to pay for it.
Thanks, James. Next question. Oh, yeah. Um, hi. Thanks. So we might be investing in some coastal property on a hill looking down <laughs> in the future, maybe. Anyway, um, Anders, this is uh, directed at you. You had just mentioned in your um, talk there before around with the ETS and the point of obligation sitting with the processor versus the producer. Are you able to just talk through a bit more what that might look like if it was with the producer? Is it a tax? How does that work? Where does it go to? Well, the way the regulation works at the moment, if you put agriculture in, into the ETS, which it isn't at the moment, the current point of ab obligation is at the processor level. So be that the dairy factory um, or the meat processor. And that will basically be a per kilo charge against your carcass weight. Um, the downside to that is you sort of look at the equity of it, and if you're a finisher, you're going to get hammered by it. If you're store property, it won't touch you. So where's the incentive to actually change anything? And as I said, you know, there's no, in no incentive to make a change if any everything you produce just gets taxed the same no matter what. To do it at the farm level, you need a way of actually measuring it, and that's basically been put in the too hard basket. Um, I'd say the most likely one, um, if you all have, um, or you know, we're getting to the point where you're all required to have farm plans that have nutrient budgets, you're probably going to be using Overseer. Overseer is actually probably reasonably good at doing greenhouse gas emissions, so that would be potentially one way of doing it um, without going past something that's not reasonably well understood at the moment. Thanks, Anders. Peter, just really quickly, the timelines around the low-carbon bill. Can you just quickly talk us through that? Sure. Um, so the zero-carbon bill was, went, went in the House um, just recently, and consultations opened for that, I think, a couple of days ago. And I understand there's going to be a national consultation roadshow um, happening in July, um, <laughs> although the dates haven't been confirmed yet. Um, but the, a lot of those conversations around the role of agriculture, um, the different gases, where the processor and um, processor level or farm level are conversations that are all going to be ha had as part of that ongoing conversation. Um, so the zero and carbon bill by definite, a bill is something that hasn't been enacted yet. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of um, a lot of discussions to be had in that space. But yeah, there's, um, as I understand it, the consultation will be happening in through through July. So we need to be looking out for yep, the opportunity absolutely. to have your but say. The submissions close on the 16th of July yep. on the bill. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay, next question. Robin. Yeah. Yes. Um, that leads on well to my question because, um, you know, writing submissions, we get into the political debate of are we going to be heard and, and conceptually farmers are at the pointy end of this and have been in Canterbury, especially for the last 10 years. So we're actually quite regulated on our farm environment plans. Um, we do run a biological system, so we're very, very regulated by Mother Nature and we do adapt. And I, Anders and James's presentation showed it, those slides of yours, James, um, with the erosion from, from catchment board days. You know, there was a big turnaround on your latest slides. Where I farm on Banks Peninsula, you know, we're up to nearly 28, 30% biodiversity back in our farming systems. We're getting pushed, and I reckon there's a real risk that you're going to push too far with the farming community, that we're going to dumb down and back off because the conversation is particularly complex and complicated, and no disrespect to the policy, you've got a tough job, but it dumbs us down, and I, I feel we're accountable now, and we are all accepting that, but we're not being heard by the rest of New Zealand, we're definitely not being heard by from the politicians, and there's no equity in the discussion. So. I want to see that change. I want to feel that I am prepared to do this stuff because we've done a lot. And, and I know, but you know, when you're managing biological systems with water systems and you spent two and a half million on your water system like the first speaker, you don't have a broken water pipe. It doesn't run down a hill. So we live by our example every day. So I want an assurance from the panel, and I don't know how you're going to give it, that that message is going to go loud and clear that rural New Zealand is getting a little bit pissed. I think we've done it. We're doing our bit. We will follow, and we will follow by good example. But we want to see that balanced from the rest of the economy because carbon is the big one. 
if yep. you can go overseas and then plant a pine tree, and I feel good about it, are we fixing climate change? No, we're not. James, comment first from you, uh, then from you, Andy, please. So I can give you an absolute assurance that um, the regional council sector is acutely aware of the risk that we are collectively running of alienating the farming community by pushing too hard and too fast mm -hmm. and also eroding uh, the economic base of, of the country. And right now, our sector, in fact, we dispatched the letter yesterday to the Minister for the Environment, is working very closely with the primary sector around getting the government to understand that the next big wave of reform it wants to push around fresh water needs to be done in an incredibly targeted and calibrated and sensibly timed manner so that we don't, uh, we, we don't have um, uh, un unintended consequences economically or socially in our rural communities and we also build on the goodwill of farmers and take people with us. So, so that's something that, that we're certainly uh, aware of and pushing just with respect to climate change and the zero carbon bill, my personal view um, is that the PCE uh, has raised some very valid uh, issues and I, I, I'm very supportive of Anders' uh, position around the fact that if we don't give farmers practi the practical ability to offset oblig their, their emissions on farm, uh, then we're gonna get absolutely no buy-in from the farming sector. It'll just be seen as a tax uh, and another cost of doing business because farmers are practical people and if you give them the ability to actually make a difference within their own business, they'll take that, but if it's just another cost, uh, then we're just going to lose them. So I think there's a real risk with these policy settings of just losing all of it across both climate and water and we're going to have a big standoff between central government and the farming community and regional councils will get caught in the middle. I think a good point there, James, too, that climate and water have to be thought about together. Um, Peter, is central government listening? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We heard it from Peter. Thank you, Peter. Absolutely. And, and you're providing what? mechanisms to, for people to be heard? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, I think like, this isn't a new conversation, and government has, um, since the, the, well, since the previous government was there and the new government, the, the, the government has sought a lot of advice. We've had the Biological Emissions Reference Group, we've had the Forestry Reference Group, um, we've had um, international commentators, um, we've had um, Judy and Penny's adaptation report, um, there's the, and we've had interim, the Interim Climate Change Commission or committee um, working to develop um, ideas with the Pro Productivity Commission, the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment, all providing information and advice to the government. So they clearly understand the the careful balance that government has to make in terms of meeting their international obligations and but also doing right by New Zealand wider society. So I, okay. I have to, of course I'm going to say yes. But. <laughs> and we're going to hold your comments for the moment because I'm conscious we're going... Ian. Ian Knowles. Yep, just a follow-on um, question from the last one. I just think uh, Peter put a graph up right at the start of his presentation forecasting the next 100 years and it looked like we're pretty well stuffed. But I think if we look back at the last 100 years and the huge gains in technology and management that um, we've had in the agricultural sector, is the panel confident that what we'll learn in, in the next 100 years will help fix it? So will we have the, have you got the confidence that we will have the tools and management to actually make a positive impact? And that question is going to go to Peter. Yeah, can I? Back to yes. So I suppose the first bit of the question is that there's been what agriculture has achieved in terms of reducing its emissions since the 1990s has been massive. And there's, there's quite a bit of work to show that if we had achieved the productivity improvement just through increasing cattle animal numbers, our emissions would be 40% higher than they are now. Um, and that's been done through improvements in genetics, improvements in farmer skills, improvements in soil fertility, improvements in pasture quality, all those types of things. And But there's still more that, and James, James talks about it in terms of the planting um, timber planting on erosion, erodible land. There's still um, work that can be done to improve um, things on farm that will reduce emissions and also and also maintain or improve productivity um, through genetics, through better um, measuring of, of livestock weights and increasing fertility rates and reducing empty rates. All those types of things will will help in terms of the um, building resilience within the farming business, but also reducing emissions. Judy, just quickly. Yeah, I just want to comment that this, the, the answer to your question is it depends, and it depends how fast 
the impacts come upon the sector and whether or not the um, innovation for changing land use, for um, um, withstanding some of the stresses that you're going to experience can actually be sustained quick enough and taken up quick enough to enable you to adapt. So it's not just about <laughs> the, um, the technologies to reduce emissions. While that's happening, you're going to have to be adjusting to the impacts of climate change. And some of those things you will have not experienced and you will have no answers to at the moment. And the question is whether or not those answers will come quick enough. So you've got a double whammy, basically, to deal with. So that, that's really what the point of some of my comments were about. And just really quickly before we go to Mike, can business as usual and the way our farmers thinking of the one or two floods, two floods in quick succession, how quickly your communities set themselves up to deal with the next one, can business as usual push back on Judy's comment? Are farmers able to respond quickly enough individually and as a community? I, th I think give, given clear direction about where they're headed, yes, they can. Thank you. Mike. Yes, I just wanted to follow on from um, what Peter said there and also Anders had a slide up earlier about uh, future directions. And um, it's, it's more about, you know, um, what the tools that we've got actually in the future, what, exactly what they are, the inhibitors, the foragers, um, the genetics. What sort of numbers are we talking about here? What sort of reductions can we look at? And where is the research at the moment on those? Did you get that? Oh, sorry. Anders. Basically, the, the business and as usual side of things, which is probably around genetics and that sort of thing, we're probably improving um, our emissions per kilo product at about 1% a year. The ones that'll probably give us big gains are things like um, the methane in inhibitors and the research that I've seen, that can be anywhere from 30 to 100%. Um, the ones that are at that lower range are actually quite promising in that they're basically, if you feed it, it works. If you stop feeding it, everything goes back to normal, which basically means you haven't really screwed around with stuff, and I think that's actually going to be much safer. Um, what, so. And is, coming from your tech background, where is, where is the tech capability going to hit that's going to have you making these really early decisions in a way that you can't now because of your capacity with data? Basically, the internet's giving everybody a lot better access to information. Um, if you're in a rural area, you probably got limited access. That's starting to improve, um, you know, hopefully within the next decade. I don't think it's going to be in the next how, year or two. How far are we from the John Deere video? <laughs> Who's seen the uh, most recent John Deere video? It's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that's, well, if, if you're an <laughs> arable cropper, not, yep. that, not that far. Exactly. Uh, and, yep. and sheep and beef. I'm not sure how much of that we actually need. Great, thank you. Uh, where were we? Hamish, thank you. Um, yeah, this is probably a question for Judy. Just a bit of context uh, from my background. In the last five years, I'll stand up so you can see me. No, you're right in the light. <laughs> sit down, <laughs> sit down. I'll sit down there. <laughs> um, in the last five years, we've had a combination of uh, cropping and livestock. Now, this is actual real data. Uh, in three years, we've taken our carbon in our soil from 5% down to 3% in our cropping regime. And our neighbouring cropping farms are all around 1% carbon, and most of the sheep and beef farms are around 5% carbon. Now, I've stopped cropping because I have put approximately 40,000 kilograms of carbon into the atmosphere, and the cropping farmers are putting up to 100,000 kilograms of tons of carbon into the atmosphere. And the way I'm going to put carbon back into that soil is through my livestock. My livestock, uh, the energy that goes into rearing those livestock is very, very low compared to a high chemical, high energy um, intensive cropping operation. And before I heard you say that people in New Zealand, I'm talking about New Zealand pasture-based context, uh, doing their best for the climate by eating less meat. <laughs> now, I want you to quantify that, please, and tell me why is that better for the climate to eat less meat and eat more bread? 
yeah, you're assuming that they're switching to um, bread, but never mind, that's another <laughs> question. No, I think if you look up the, um, the figures in, on, on, in internationally, these are international figures, about the amounts of energy that are going into the production of red meat, it's got the highest carbon input. And this, is, this comes down to how you measure it, which, which, yeah, and I agree with you, that there are systems that are available to reduce that in a pasture-based system in New Zealand. So I'm not disputing that. All I was saying is that people are eating less meat because, because they have seen the figures that say that carbon is, um, that, that beef, the production of beef is, say, for instance, higher carbon input than production of chicken. So I'm, I'm going to actually stop this because I think so what we have to do is look at full life cycle assessment. Well, full yeah, life cycle assessment gonna, is, is exactly, exactly what, what, what you're talking about, isn't it? Say. So if we look at the whole, yeah. Hamish, you're raising some really interesting points around soil carbon that we can park to bears after the event because it's a big topic. Well, okay, well, yeah, but there next. Are yes, Sorry, yeah. I, I just just draw a linkage here between part, yeah. partly what, what, what Peter and Anders were saying as well, and that is that relative to those feedlot... Uh, uh, beef production systems, for example, in the nor northern hemisphere, we've got a really good story to tell about uh, lower greenhouse gas intensive uh, red meat production in New Zealand. So, so, you know, that is an opportunity, but we actually have to have a verified and really positive story to tell, and part of that goes to our whole farming system. Uh, next question, in the middle. This might be a wee bit simple for the crowd, but as a younger person trying to figure out how all the carbon stuff is working, I think as a farming community it's hard to not feel targeted by the equality that they're starting to legislate between methane emissions and carbon dioxide emissions. Is there anyone up there who can give us an idea? I mean, my understanding from reading is that the methane um, goes back into the cycle after 12 years, whereas the carbon dioxide is a very long-term gas. Is there anybody up there who can shed light or give me some real science around that? Yeah, I, I think there are papers that have been produced specifically on that for the Parliamentary Commissioner um, by Dr Andy Reisinger, um, which some of you will be aware of. That is available online, and you can read that. It's, it's too complicated for me to explain at the moment, but uh, yeah. at, at a meeting like this. But uh, the, point, the point is that um, even though there is that cycle, there are big question marks over whether or not the atmosphere um, is going to continue to be able to break down methane. And there is residual impacts and changes that are occurring in the atmosphere um, which are still uncertain. Um, and there are some suggestions that, um, that it isn't just as simple as the methane dying off after a particular number of years. So there are some risks involved, yeah. which have been documented. To Sorry. put it really simple, the, the three major gases, they're all different. They should all be treated differently. We should attack them differently and look at how sectors respond differently. The basket approach of treating everything is not helpful. And I'm happy later to talk you through the methane one. Yeah. Uh, Dave's been waiting for quite a long time, and then we're just about to wind up. Nicole, we might have to grab you later. Dave. He's been waiting remarkably patiently. I always have a saying for the last couple of years, there's a lot of symbolism over substance. <coughs> so one of the, th and I'm sure farmers are going to adapt as soon as you tell us the tools to combat um, carbon and, and fresh waters all goes together. My question is, is globally, and it was just quite an or whoever said about the two plastic bottles that the netball court. I'm thinking about when I've been through Southeast Asia, the Middle East, um, and all these places, and the plastics problems that you have in those countries. And then I'm also thinking about, we're talking about uh, electricity and the carbon. How are we going to stop famine in the Middle East and Southeast Asia? And how are they all going... They're having a hell of a bigger impact on fossil fuels than we're ever going to have down here. So without them creating wars and so, hunger... So we are tiny, but if you add together all the tiny countries, we're 30% of the globe. So, but my, how do we help the Southeast Asia 
how do we help Middle East from overheating? So it's probably a question to Julie. Quick, short answer. We're nearly out of time. Judy? Well, I don't know that there is an answer to that. There are international organisations that w where countries work together and um, there is no doubt that some of those ar areas in Asia are producing an enormous amount of pollution. But the extent to which they can shift, and China is a good example, where sh China has been able to shift into green energy extremely quickly. And Peter. so some of those countries have the capacity to do that, but others don't. Um, one of the things I talked about in my talk is a little bit around the work that we're doing internationally, mm -hmm. New Zealand's doing. So, for example, with the Global Research Alliance, there's a big focus on helping developing countries better understand their emissions profile, because um, most of them don't report their emissions. Um, and New, Ze New Zealand is one of the top four or five countries in the world in terms of our understanding of what our emissions profile is. And so if, you, if a country better understands that, then they can start targeting both research and policies and things to identify the hotspots. Um, but there's no, like the Paris Agreement is a, is a standalone agreement for something where the whole world, other than a couple of countries, have said this is a problem and we all have to find solutions together. Now, you can have a whole separate conversation about whether countries are, um, are responding to that in, in the right way and there's certainly countries that are fossil fuel suppliers that are... Um, that are looking to slow, them, slow the, the process down, but there's a whole lot of conversations going on to look at how we can best support the Southeast Asian countries, African countries, the ones that will be most affected by climate change. Thanks very much. Look, at this point, we have run out of time for this. I know that Judy has to make a fast exit back to the other conference that we borrowed her from, but I'd like firstly to thank our panel, to Anders for keeping one foot firmly on the ground, to pointing out that business as usual and farmers are ready to run with every tool that comes their way. To Peter, who promises us that central government are listening, all ears open. So when he turns up in your region in the coming weeks, make sure you're there. To Judy, who bought that flavour of it's a not only about the gases, it's about all of us finding a way to adapt to a future. And finally to James, who gave, I think, you a real challenge when you looked at how far has farming really come? Are we doing what we can do? And reminded us how important our farm plans are going to be. And James, it's not only having a plan in the bottom drawer, is it? It's actually doing something with that plan. So I hope you've seen the challenge and I hope you've seen some of the opportunities and I hope you promise to go home and do one thing differently when you think about what our panel took us through today.